I've recently been enamored with the sheer oddity that is Tokyopop. In a world where manga can be bought at any place that sells books, it's hard to think of a time where obtaining manga was difficult. Well, in the 90s, anime and manga were barely a thing in the US, but one man dared to change that. Stu Levy founded Mixzine in 1997, and it was a magazine that featured chapters from various manga. Now, it should be noted that before Stu Levy came into the scene, there were other companies adapting popular series into the Western market. US Manga Corps comes to mind, they would release manga in American comic book format, and Viz would release some titles in comic book and graphic novel form. Viz also had their own manga magazine entitled Manga Vision, so in order to compete with Viz, Stu Levy had an ace up his sleeve. Mixzine featured chapters of Sailor Moon, one of the hottest new shows on the air, and Mixzine would be the only place to read it, officially at least. The magazine would also feature chapters of Parasite, Ice Blade, and Magic Knight Ray Earth, providing a decent balance of genres to all readers. For a time, Sailor Moon videotapes sold in Toys R Us came bundled with a subscription card in Mixzine, meaning it could be redeemed for a free issue of the magazine without having to commit to a full-on subscription. Soon, Mixzine would announce mixed pocket manga starting with Magic Knight Ray Earth and eventually Sailor Moon would follow. I've actually got an issue of Mixzine here from December 1997, fairly early on into the magazine's initial run. The front page features a gorgeous illustration from Naoko Takeuchi, and in a much smaller section there's an image of the quote-unquote SM Dancers, a group of Sailor Moon cosplayers that would perform dances at certain events. Information on them is pretty slim, but if you use enough quotation marks in your Google searches, the sky is the limit. I found a decent amount of pictures, and while I thought I would never find actual video because who the hell would be randomly recording these girls at E3 1997, I found a website called Anime Nostalgia Bomb that had an article about this specific issue of Mixine, in which they reference video proof and mention a German video game report, but no video was on the site itself. German video game report E3 1997 was just a quick Google search away, and yeah, for whatever reason, this German gaming report was uploaded to YouTube, and at the very end features footage of the SM dancers. I didn't think purchasing this volume of a magazine would lead me down this rabbit hole, but here we are. Now getting back to the magazine itself, it starts out to be your typical affair with a couple ads, a foreword by the editor presumably, but yeah, about 95% of this thing is just the manga. Now I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but don't call it a magazine if you're not going to have any articles or write-ups about the series you're presenting. It just feels lazy in the worst way possible. What makes matters worse, however, is that whenever they do write something, it comes across in the most douchey way possible. In the beginning of this issue, they talk about their trip to E3 1997, but the way this shit is worded is so terribly 90s, like I don't even think think a lot of what they're saying here made sense back then. Too nice really started jamming on the last day, cutting records with his elbows, his feet, and even his teeth. What the f*** does that mean? We also had a b-ball court. Our publisher Stu refused to work and just shot hoops all day with Larry. Who's Larry? I mean seriously, they don't mention his name anywhere else, so I suppose by issue 3 of this magazine the readers must know who Larry is, right? And by the way, that last quote just encapsulates the entire personality of Stu Levy very well, as we'll see later on. Once you flip to the Sailor Moon portion of the issue, we find another douchebagism that caught my attention. They describe Naoko Takauchi as a manga artist and then clarify that manga is the Japanese word for the mixed phrase, motionless picture entertainment. The only way I can describe how I felt reading that was the ick. Like seriously, how far up their own asses were their heads to type that out and think it sounded perfectly fine? Like as if graphic novels didn't exist or something and weren't already being used to describe English translations of manga. No, they just had to find something to trademark after all. Before the beginning of Magic Knight Ray Earth, they do it again, but in an even more infuriating manner. Shoujo means young girl in Japanese, and manga means motionless picture entertainment, which you should know by now. No, it f***ing doesn't. Anyways, let's talk about the actual manga, or sorry, motionless picture entertainment. Every single page of this thing is in monotone color. Granted, it's a different color for each story, but holy hell, it just looks so ugly. It would have been cheaper for them to print on white paper, and it wouldn't have looked as bad if they did. Honestly, it's just really distracting trying to read any of this. Not as distracting as calling Usagi Bunny the entire time, but that's besides the point. Now, manga aside, they do showcase some reader art, talk about fan mail, and advertise to you in the most egregious way possible. So what they're doing here is taking panels from manga, erasing whatever dialogue was there, and replacing it by making the characters advertise products to you. I'm almost certain they didn't ask the manga ka for permission to do this, or maybe it was hidden somewhere in their contracts, but it just feels so wrong. Like Usagi advertising the new Volkswagen Beetle? or for fingernail polish now available in drugstores nationwide? Listen, if this was the only way you were able to read Sailor Moon or any of the others featured back then, then more power to you. It was certainly accessible if nothing else. It's just extremely hard to read this nowadays without A being annoyed at the colored pages or B cringing at the editor's writings. When it's all said and done, Mixine helped introduce these wonderful stories to a whole generation of English speakers, so I can't fault it too much. 
1998, it was announced that Sailor Moon's weekly chapter releases would be moved from Mixine and onto Mix Entertainment's other magazine, Smile, a girl's fashion magazine. Fan outcry was loud and immediate with the hacking of Mixine's website, Mix Online, following not long after. The landing page was altered to show an image of Sailor Moon flashing her breasts with the caption, Got Milk? right below her. On the page also read, Why are you here? Stu Lee, the president of Mix Entertainment, is a money-grubbing liar. His sole purpose is to remove you from your money. Signed, Pissed Fan. Controversy seemed to follow Stu Levy everywhere he went. Notably, he was criticized for Naoko Takeuchi's appearance at San Diego Comic-Con, where people claimed he had her on a leash and that he prevented fans from giving her gifts. And while it's from his own account, he said these rumors were false. In November 1998, Mix Entertainment announced a brand new e-commerce site named Tokyopop, which would focus on selling anime, manga, and Japan-related items. In August 1999, it was announced that Mixine's name would be changed to Tokyopop, stating that the new name Tokyopop TM captures both the true essence of the magazine as well as Tokyo's status as the world capital of digital pop culture where technology and entertainment truly converge. So they would begin publishing Tokyo Pop Magazine, but this time it would only feature three manga series dropping down from Mixine's height of five concurrent series. In August 2000, just one year after rebranding to Tokyo Pop, the magazine would be discontinued. When 2002 came along, Tokyo Pop launched its 100% authentic manga line, which would print volumes in the Japanese original right to left format. Tokyo Pop would also sell its manga at $9.99 per volume, making it the cheapest manga out there. Pretty soon they became industry leaders, and at their height they held a 50% market share on manga in the US alone. Putting aside the fact that that's an insane number, all seemed well for Tokyo Pop. But these days they're essentially a shell company, so what went wrong? Well, there's plenty of videos out there talking about the downfall of the company. I'd recommend watching Red Bard's video about the downfall of Tokyo Pop specifically, but to put it short, the recession, the loss of Kodansha titles, and poor business decisions on the part of Stu Levy. There were signs of a decline in quality before 2008, however. All right, so imagine you're a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender, but maybe the toys are too expensive, you don't have a GameCube to play the latest awful licensed schlock, but you do have 10 bucks from your mom for the local Scholastic Book Fair. Here you'll find various I Spy books, Guinness Book of World Records, but all of these you can't afford. Maybe you'll find Avatar The Last Airbender The Lost Scrolls, but those are boring and they don't even have any pictures. Well, that's where our good friends at Tokyo Pop come to play with Cinemanga. No? No takers? Come on, Avatar was already similar to anime anyway, so what's the difference? Oh, it's just pictures from the show edited into comic book format, and it's left to right, and it sucks ass. Alright, well what did you expect? It's not like they could be releasing, you know, normal manga or anything, they can't market to children that way. So apparently, since these were sold at book fairs, Avatar The Last Airbender Cinemanga sold very well for Tokyo Pop. In fact, they sold half a million copies for Avatar, and another half a million copies for... S SpongeBob SquarePants. So a Spongebob anime? But that's not all, they also sold Cinemanga for That's So Raven, Hannah Montana, Lizzie McGuire, Kim Possible, Star Wars, Akira, Cardcaptor Sakura. Those two already f***ing had manga, why are you bastardizing them in comic form? And yeah, Akira is real child friendly alright, but none of this tops their most ridiculous Cinemanga to ever be released. Are you ready for this? F***ing Family Guy Cinemanga. Family Guy is an anime now and no one can convince me otherwise. It just makes me wonder, why weren't these marketed as comic books? Why did the word manga have to be attached? attached to these low effort, barely even comic books at all. It honestly baffles me how these were ever released, let alone how popular they were. I used to actually own a couple of volumes of the Avatar series, and I'm sure I had other series as well. But f man, I've never seen a video online talk about the Family Guy manga in detail before, so here we go. Yes, I actually wasted my money on this. So it's basically taking two episodes of Family Guy and adapting it into Cinemanga format. I say Cinemanga format because honestly it doesn't resemble a comic book too well either. The text bubbles are about as big as each panel and there's just tons and tons of empty space between each panel. They also decided to make each panel shaped into some awful skew morphism blobs and man I already have a hard enough time watching Family Guy by itself but this is just ridiculous. First of all, Cinemanga volumes were targeted at children but Family Guy is certainly not a children's property like all these other options. So I have to ask myself, who the f*** is this meant for? I really just don't understand what the point of these things are. And would you believe that there are like, hundreds upon hundreds of them? Go to any bookselling website and type in Cinemanga and jeez man, this is a bit overkill. There were up to 13 volumes of Lizzie McGuire, 7 volumes of Kim Possible, there was Card Captors, Hannah Montana, Jackie Chan Adventures, that Disney movie Enchanted, Power Rangers, Rave Master, Spy Kids, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Cars, Cars the Manga. There's too many to talk about honestly and they even released these abominations in Japan too and that's just the icing on the cake isn't it? How incredibly insulting to the art of manga creation to release these fucking 
things alongside them. Around the same time, Viz released Animanga, which is like Cinemanga, but with a different name. It's very difficult to find information online for these, but from what I can tell, they didn't release nearly as many Animanga as Tokyo did with Cinemanga. I've been able to find Yu-Gi-Oh, Inuyasha, Naruto, and that's about it. Honestly, Viz probably did a better job here than Tokyo Pop, if not for any other reason that this is actually kind of readable. Or at least it doesn't give me an aneurysm just from trying to read it. Circling back to Family Guy for a minute, let's take a bit of a break from the main video and talk about something from my childhood. Because let's be real, when am I ever going to be able to talk about this on the channel again? This is Seasons 1 and 2 of Family Guy on PSP. Yeah, for a while Sony was trying to sell the UMD format as more than just games, and they actually released a decent amount of anime on the UMD format as well. And Family Guy does have a manga, so yeah, I'm just going to consider this one of those releases. I don't know, what can I say? I got nostalgic in my search for Family Guy Cinemanga, and probably against my better judgment bought it again. I think there's just something funny about the bit crushed audio and the slightly worse than DVD quality video. I mean, for the time, this was great. Imagine Imagine being able to carry entire seasons of TV around with you with very little quality compromised, all in like 2004. It just goes to show how far along technology has come in such a short amount of time. Hmm. Didn't think this video would be going in depth about Family Eye, but we all have to live with the choices we've made, right? So once Tokyo Pop would inevitably lose their Kodansha license, several ongoing manga releases would have to be cancelled, leaving many series unfinished, notably Initial D, a series that goes for an absurd amount of money online, especially considering that you'll never be able to finish a Tokyo Pop Initial D collection. Speaking of Initial D, Tokyo Pop did an English dub of it in 2003, and holy mother of god, let's just let this speak for itself. This is the bombing, dude! Tack, how come you never leveled with me before? I wish I knew that you and Natalie were buds. Jeez, I haven't I talked to her in over a year. I'm not really sure what went down. I mean. <laughs> huh? Tokyo Pop's dub of Initial D is what I can only call extremely dated. Gone is the familiar Eurobeat score, and it's been replaced with cheesy rock and hip hop. The show's opening theme is, well, just listen to it. As for the dialogue, are we sure Stu Levy didn't write this shit? Or the editor of Mixine? Either way, it's distracting. There's gotta be a way to make some quick bankage. I mean, check it out. Right now, we're pumping fumes at the gas station part-time, right? Say we go full-time in the summer. The most we're looking at is pulling in one G. This totally blows. Now, as for the voice cast, it's not the worst. There's a Steve Bloom jump scare. I've been known to get on the black lane. Oh, you look great. There's Vic Magnonia, however you say that. Colleen Clinkenbeard, Kyle Hebert, Lex Lang, Eric Vale, and many more. Honestly, the cast is not the problem. It's entirely down to the clunky dialogue, awful music, and the censoring that early anime dubs would become famous for. If you really need to watch Initial D, watch the Funimation dub. I find it kind of odd that this was the direction Tokyo Pop wanted to take after being pretty successful in the manga market. I know manga and anime are very closely associated, but for Christ's sake, you're a publishing company, not a dubbing or film studio. In addition to Initial D, they also had releases for Marmalade Boy, Saint Tail, Samurai Girl, Real Bout High School, Vampire Princess Miu, Brigadoon, and something called High School Ghostbusters? What the f- Alright, now that's gotta be its own video. I would honestly take a look at all these dubs, but considering how hard some of these are to find and how terrible Initial D was, I just don't want to risk my sanity like that. I'm also not certain if Tokyo Pop just released these shows on DVDs with subtitle, or if they actually dubbed them or not, since there's not a ton of info online. Around 2011, I assume Stu Levy started having a midlife crisis or something, and started a reality TV contest called America's Greatest Otaku. And spoilers, it is one of the most abhorrent examples of otaku culture you can find. For many years, I've been bringing Japanese pop culture to America, and now I've decided to take a journey across this land to search for otaku culture. Stu himself is very awkward and not great on camera, and a lot of the interviews feel like everyone's at gunpoint. Now where do you cosplay? I like showing them off whenever I can. I've actually worn this one to Albertsons one time. It was after a, an event at the mall. We decided we were hungry, so we went to Albertsons to get some food, and uh, the workers there were very amused. They even took me aside and had me take some pictures with them. So you're spreading otaku culture? Yes to supermarkets. Yeah. This was also a period where people started taking content on the internet seriously, but if this was really a way to get people invested in the brand of Tokyo Pop, then wouldn't you have at least tried to upload this on YouTube at launch? Or at least anywhere else besides Hulu? I think this honestly might have killed any notoriety this show could have gotten with actual anime fans, because by the time the series was uploaded to YouTube, Tokyo Pop the company was dead in the water, and barely any of the episodes surpassed 10k views, with many never even going over 1k. 
I don't think I've gotten across just how out of place Stu Levy feels in this situation. Just listen to this interview. It's very clear that he's just trying to turn this show into a way to revive his very, very dead company. How does the Tokyo Pop tour fit into Tokyo Pop's overall objectives as a publisher? We are more than a publisher. We're a lifestyle and media brand. This is core. It's about reaching out to our fans and getting to know who they are. They are the reason we exist. All right, dude, I don't think anyone ever considered Tokyo Pop to be a lifestyle brand, even when they ran a fashion magazine. How have Tokyo Pop's objectives changed over the past five years? They haven't. The overall goal has always been the same, to build a global brand and character franchises that reflect the otaku lifestyle. The tactical approach of how to accomplish that goal has evolved as technology affects the way we consume media more significantly. We are all in a transition from print to digital, and in our company, from manga to movie as well. It kind of just sounds like he's pulling random words out of his ass now. In our company, from manga to movie as well? Yeah, just let me know how the Tokyo Pop movies are going. I mean, besides high school ghost hustlers. I imagine that the main function of the tour is to promote the Tokyo Pop brand. But in order for a brand to stay afloat financially, the company behind it has to get merchandise slash service associated with the brand into consumer hands. How will the Tokyo Pop tour lead to sales of Tokyo Pop merchandise? It may not directly affect merchandise sales, but we hope for an overall halo effect as fans reconnect with the brand and learn about the way we're evolving with them and for them. Well, looking at the company circa 2011, it certainly didn't give an overall Halo effect. Hey, we lost all of our best-selling franchises and people don't want to buy manga anymore. What do we do? All right, so we're going to go on a press tour, okay? And no, that's it. And I wonder why Tokyo Pop went under. After their tour that was definitely going to save the company, Tokyo Pop essentially shut down, all except for their German publishing division. It seemed like the end of an era, that is, until Anime Expo 2015, where Tokyo Pop announced they'd be publishing manga again for some reason. Since then, Tokyo Pop has pretty much just been publishing Disney manga. They've had a couple of shoujo and yuri manga and stuff like that, but yeah, the majority of what they push nowadays is Disney. You don't know anime until you've read the Toy Story manga, man. Honestly, Tokyo Pop has just been in a sad state for a while now, and just recently Stu Levy announced he'd be stepping down from US operations. It's very easy to look back at Tokyo Pop and Stu Levy and absolutely tear them to pieces, but what he and his company did were very important for anime and manga in the grand scheme of things. Still, it doesn't help that every single media appearance from Stu, even if just spoken interviews, made it look like he's been having a midlife crisis since the late 90s. Do I hate Tokyo Pop? Not really. But would I ever willingly watch the initial D-dub or collect Cinemanga? F*** no. Tokyo Pop is an important part of American otaku history and that's where it needs to stay in the past.